Welcome to the Cashflow Guys Podcast. That's right, boys and girls. You know what time it is and you know where you are. This is Tyler Chef, and I am the host of the Cashflow Guys Podcast. And this week, guys, I'm going to cover the top 10 most expensive mistakes that you can make when you're getting into vacation rentals. And you're probably wondering, how do I know these mistakes? How would Tyler possibly know these mistakes? Doesn't he always do everything right and perfect the first time? And the answer is, hell no. In fact, I've made lots of these mistakes. I've got, I could make this probably a top 100 list if I really sat down and put my mind to it, but that would bore you to tears. After all, you know, making a couple of mistakes probably wouldn't hurt you, right? We don't want you to think you're perfect and get your health, your head all swelled up like mine is. But um, I, this episode really does come from the heart. It's things that I've done that I've, friends of mine have done that we, together we've made our series of mistakes. And the cool thing about the short-term rental business, at least in the Tampa Bay area, is I've got to know other operators in my market and I've got to see what they do right and what they do wrong and what works for them and what doesn't work and, and the whole nine yards. So it makes the error curve not as bad, right? You, I learn by watching others and observing what other folks do and try not to repeat the mistakes that they've made. I've read a lot of books and guys, I got to tell you books, the majority of what I've learned in real estate over the years has come from two different sources and YouTube isn't one of them. Granted, YouTube works for some folks. It doesn't really work for me because I really can't find many interesting real estate videos out there uh, that aren't about as sexy as watching paint dry. But I do enjoy reading books on real estate and books on psychology and things like that. And But I also learn by doing. That means I roll up my sleeves, I get out there, and I fail forward. And fail being the operative word here. I do make mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes. I still make mistakes. But that's how I learn. And those mistakes don't always cost me money. But th this week, we're going to talk about the ones that do. And one of the biggest ones right out of the gate as I see lots of folks that want to get started in short-term rental, they've let you guys, maybe you guys listen to the podcast. You've heard, you know, my short-term rentals perform really, really well, but know this, they didn't, they haven't always been that way. Okay. We've had some rough periods, especially starting out a lot of bumps and bruises, skinned our knee, bloody nose, that type of thing. Um, this is not a get rich quick. And that's the, I'm going to start right there thinking you're going to get rich quick uh, just because it's a vacation rental or a short-term rental type of situation. When you start to think, when you're focused so much on the profit that you start to lose sight of the other things that are equally important in addition to the profit, like the risk, for example, and more importantly, the expenses. And we tend to try to, I see this a lot. I've done this over the years. We tend to want to lie to ourselves. We'll skip over things that we know dang well are legit expenses, things that we know that's going to come in, like the power bill. Well, I got news for you in a short-term rental. Guess who's paying the power bill? That'd be you. And then you'll do things like, I, I one guy I know cut his air conditioning to, I think it was 77 degrees is as low as he would let the air conditioning go down. So the people from people from Florida, that probably doesn't phase them as much. But folks from New York, and if you're a fat boy like I am or used to be and losing a lot of weight, that's going to drive you nuts. So this dude had a hell of a time with feedback on YouTube or on uh, uh, Airbnb because he was a, he was kind of a tight ass, right? He's a cheap ass, and he was restricting people from turning the air below seventy seven degrees. Um, because the folks from up north, you know, you guys get down to Florida, and you're like, oh my god, it's the surface of the sun. I'm gonna die, and they're they're telling you that in December, right? And for whatever reason, they'll crank that bad boy down to fifty if you'd let them. Um, full disclosure, though, I limit ours to I think I limit it to six uh, seventy. I think it is seventy degrees. I don't let it go down below seventy or seventy two. And the reason for that is uh, it's hard on the units, but 77, that's, that's a bit much. I would not put it down that or put it up that high or restrict it. And some of you are asking, how the hell do you restrict the temperature? And that comes from having the digital thermostats like the Nest or the Google Nest thermostats. You can remotely change the temperatures. You can lock out the thermostats so they can't adjust it and things like that. But know this, if you make people uncomfortable, they're going to freak out and they're going to leave you lousy feedback and it's going to cost you a fortune. Um, one bad feedback can cost you a unlimited amount of reservations. You know, it happens, right? Folks get, get mad and nobody likes to be hot and miserable. So at the end of the day, if the difference is between a $50 electric bill and a 150 electric bill, are you willing to walk away from $10,000 in reservations to save a hundred bucks? Well, that's kind of dumb. That's simple math. No, you don't do that. 
but yeah, if you're going to limit it, at least limit it because of damage. And my AC guy, and I'm not an AC expert by any means, my AC guy says the system, you can leave it at 68 to 70 and not have any problem and it can run 24 hours a day. And so be it. Um, I have other guy, AC guys like, oh, that's ridiculous. It'll fall apart. But you know, we've been doing it like this for years and years and years and years and years. And we really haven't had any problems at all. So just think about that. The next thing I see is people thinking that they can slide under the radar when it comes to the laws and ordinances. And, and frankly, there's some gurus out there that are teaching this garbage. Don't cut corners when it comes to regulations and whatnot with short-term rentals. You know why? Because it, when you become that kind of a jackass, you're the person that makes legitimate people like myself and my peers that do this, that run with licenses and we do things properly and we pay our taxes, both our lodging tax, our state tax, our city taxes, we have an occupational permit. We get licensed by the state. We pay our federal income tax. You see, we play by the rules. And we find that at least smart people do. When you play by the rules and you're compliant with this type of stuff, they're going to leave you alone. But if you're a jackass about it and you're always looking to cut corners and you think you're going to stick it to the man, I got news for you. The man's not only going to stick it to you, they're going to stick it to me. And that's not cool, man, because I'm busting my hump to do things the right way. And, uh, pay my fair share and do what now granted I'm not excited about paying tax and never have been never will be but that doesn't mean I don't do it either um, do I take the tax advantages legally available to me and and granted by the Internal Revenue Service you bet your bippy I do but do I cheat on my taxes no I hire an ethical smart CPA that understands the tax code as it relates to real estate investments and then gives me or allows me to take the exemptions that are legitimate I don't play shady games and I don't skip out on lodging taxes and things like this. Here's the thing. If you give the local municipalities their taxes, they will see, even if they are dumb politicians, they will realize that there's a lot of money for them in the short-term rental game. Okay. In the state of Florida in Pinellas County, our lodging tax adds up to about 13% of every dollar we make. That's a pretty good chunk of change. That doesn't include income tax and all the other stuff. That's just lodging tax, 13%. Now, I could sit here and cry and complain about it, or I could just pay the damn tax and pass it on to my customers, which is exactly what I do. So I don't really think of myself as having to pay that tax. I just raise the rates. When the taxes go up, I raise the rates. Taxes go up some more, I raise the rates some more. Insurance goes up, I raise the rates. That's just how you do it, guys. Because here's the thing. If you put together a good product and people want to stay in your house because it's beautiful and because you're, you're a nice person and you got good feedback, you'll get the money right back. You can just keep on passing it on. You may not get away with that as easily with a long-term rental, but with a short-term, you could absolutely do that. So short, long and short of it is follow the rules. Here in Key West, you have to have it, what they call a transient license to, in order to operate a short-term rental, anything less than 28 days, a vacation rental, something like that. And there are people every week, every month, we get they have a code enforcement hearing, I should say. Every month, somebody's on the docket because they got busted for not playing by the rules. There's actually a property management company and if you want to know who they are, all you got to do to go is go to the city of Key West uh, website and look at the meeting schedule and look at the uh, the code enforcement notes and the meeting agendas. You'll see the same company. Now, I, at some point, they're probably going to get shut down, but there's the same company that continually breaks the rules and rents properties without a transient license, and they get their they get slapped every time. And the city's getting sick and tired of their garbage. So, what's going to happen is they're going to be made an example of. Because this is not the town you want to play games with. The city of Key West takes its tourism very seriously. This is a livelihood for the majority of the island. Okay, So when we have people show up trying to bend the rules or, or break the rules or slide under the radar, it doesn't fare well with the rest of us that are doing it the right way. And I'm sure the same would be the same case in, in your municipality. So don't be that guy or girl that's cutting those corners. Okay. Next huge expensive mistake that I see people making is Either you buy a property or you rent a property. Either way, maybe you're going to rent it and do rental arbitrage, which means you're going to rent it for one amount and then mark, the, mark it up and re-rent it to somebody else on the, for the vacation thing. They think the cost of insurance isn't that big of a deal. Or worse, you think that normal homeowner's insurance is going to cover you. It won't. I hear to, I'm here to tell you. It won't. Uh, any decent insurance company or legitimate insurance uh, agent should, in good faith, show you that there are probably some some residency restrictions or, or issues in your policy that will reduce your coverage or eliminate your coverage in certain cases. And I'm not an insurance expert, okay? 
but I know a lot of insurance people, and I'm here to tell you that your homeowner, regular homeowner's insurance is not going to cover short-term duration tenancy. What does that mean? Well, it means you need to get on the phone with your insurance company and say, hey, I'm going to start renting this place by the night or Airbnb, if you if you will. And, uh, and they're going to probably drop the mic for a second and then let them come back and tell you what, what type of coverage you're going to need. You would not want to find out after some ding-dong from New Jersey was smoking in bed when they weren't supposed to be smoking in your rental and they burned it to the ground that you don't have any coverage because you rented, to, rented it to them by the night instead of by the month. Don't get sucked into that. I found out, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, I did not have appropriate wind coverage on one of my buildings because I don't even know why this would be, but the fact that I rented the unit by the night or the, this actually four units by the night, the wind policy doesn't cover that. I don't know what the wind blowing and a short-term rental have in hand with each other. They would get covered fire, but not wind. I, I don't get it. Anyway, it didn't cover is the bottom line. It didn't cover. So if a big hurricane came by and blew my place down in uh, West coast of Florida, that would be a problem. I, Cause I, they would have an excuse to not cover the claim. And then I'd have to sue. And then bottom line is that would put a serious dent in my income. That would not be fun and sexy that I assure you. Um, the, and this one applies to key West and any place, this next one where a license is required. Now I'm going to say there are rules in a lot of municipalities that don't necessarily involve a license. First of all. Okay. Um, and there are lots of municipalities now, the smart ones, I think, are getting going into the licensing game, which basically means you buy a permit or a license to operate a particular property, one, two, three, anywhere street as a transient or short term rental. That way they can regulate and make sure they know who's paying their taxes and who's not, who, who isn't. And of course, if you're a bad boy or a bad girl and you're doing a lousy job, they have something to take away from you. They can remove your ability to rent these places anymore, which those of you that are buying places specifically because you're going to use them as a short-term rental, that would put a little bit of dent in your wallet now, wouldn't it? But people make the mistake of buying a property and then figuring out the license part of it. Don't do that. Okay. Don't believe the realtor when they say you got to act now and you could sort out the licensing later. That's, that's terrible advice. That's a good reason to fire that realtor on the spot. Certainly don't listen to the wholesaler. We know they're full of crap. And so is the seller. Okay. They say buyers are liars, sellers are liars. People that represent sellers can be liars too. Not all of them, but most of them. And that's just the reality of things. You need to call your local municipality and tell them that you're going to think of buying one, two, three, anywhere street over in Terre Haute, Indiana, and you want to rent it by the night and you want to know how you can do that legally. And they on the other end of the phone may say you cannot do that legally, which boy, wouldn't that be great advice before you close? That way, you don't buy a property thinking you can do something with it that you're not allowed to, and then you're going to be really unhappy when that first mortgage payment's due. So that's going to help you avoid that. Another one is um, thinking you can cut corners when it comes to furnishings and amenities. Now, I'm not saying you need to decorate the place like Trump Tower. Matter of fact, don't decorate it like Trump Tower because if you ever seen uh, Trump's apartment in New York City, I saw it on YouTube once. Good God, is that gaudy. Uh, I wouldn't want to live there, but oof. But seriously, you know, you got to decorate the place nice, which means, um, hey, regular guys, you know, gym locker guys, those guys that, you know, if you're one of those guys that, that scratches your chest, got the big old beer belly and you watch football on Sunday, chances are you should not be the guy who's picking the colors for the short term rental. OK, um, you should have somebody who has a talent for that to do it. OK, whether they be an interior designer or someone that's darn close to one should be picking that stuff out. This is one thing you don't cut corners on the look, the design don't buy cheap stuff. You know why people with short term rentals are hard on your stuff. That's the reality of things, guys. They're going to punch holes in the wall. It's going to happen. Doors are going to get knocked off the hinges. Screens are going to get window screens are going to get torn up. Furniture is going to get burns and stains in it because that's just what happens. RV, the little cute, little adorable puppy that you gave an exemption to in your pet policy will tear the hell out of the arm of that chair for no apparent reason. It's just going to happen. That doesn't mean you buy disposable stuff. That means you put it in your, when you're building your team out, have some furniture repair people in, on, on your team. We have uh, seamstresses and fabric repair people and, and cleaning people and all kinds of different repair type people on our teams. So when something gets tore up, not if, when something gets tore up, we can get it fixed. We've had, we've had the, the panels ripped out of couches. We've had the backs bent and all kinds of crazy stuff. 
And there are companies that will come out and repair furnishings. And if you do it right and your systems are set up in place, you can get reimbursed for that. Okay. Uh, Airbnb and Verbo and all these other companies will, in a lot of cases, if you, again, if you're structured properly, they will assist you. And there are insurances and things you can buy to help cover that. So don't cut corners when it comes to making it look good and making it functional and make sure you understand the amenities that the guest in your rental is going to want. For example, uh, my place, uh, the, we have the four units, the apartments, that's our short term rental place. That one, people want uh, beach chairs. That's a big deal. They want coolers and beach chairs. They usually are coming in from out of town. So then they're coming in by airplane. They're not driving very often. So they have a rental car, right? Nobody likes buying a cooler when you're in a strange town and then not being able to take it back with you on the plane or not wanting to take it back on the plane. So we went out and bought uh, coolers for each one of the apartments and beach chairs and umbrellas and stuff like that that people can take to the beach with them when they want to go to the beach. Having a property on the west coast of Florida that's in close proximity to the beach, people like to go to the beach, no doubt. So we want to make it easier for them. Uh, we have rentals that where bicycles matter. So you go to Walmart and you buy some decent bicycles. Uh, don't buy the $100 one, maybe buy the 150 one. Buy a couple bicycles and turn them loose. Maybe put some helmets in there too in case they fall down and go boom. Who knows? Um, but know what your client wants and needs. If it's a business client, high-speed internet matters to them. Maybe they're gamers or sports fans. Big screens, TVs matter to them. You should be having a good random sampling of who is the most successful operators in your market and what amenities do they offer. You should match that too. This is one time where monkey see monkey do actually works to your advantage. Uh, next thing would be buying an Airbnb or a short term rental without having any marketing skills or sales skills. Here's the thing. You want to keep that thing full year round, no matter what you're going to need to roll up your sleeves and get, make it happen, right? Get it done. When COVID hit, we lost like 80 some thousand dollars in reservations in like 18 hours. It was, I sat there watching my inbox fill up with the same email over and over again saying reservation canceled, reservation canceled, reservation canceled. I was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. So essentially all of our 2021 reservations got canceled by the guests started canceling and then Airbnb and VRBO and a couple other services that we use all just started canceling as soon as Governor DeSantis came out and said, we're shutting down the state. They just canceled everything, gave everybody their money back, which fine, but we weren't quite prepared for that. Okay. So we had to get prepared for that. We had to take massive action and get rolling with uh, getting more people in there. For us, that means we started looking at medical professionals, first responders. They are, they need a place to stay, right? Cause people are getting COVID all over the damn place. So some people, they needed to separate themselves from their family because they didn't want to infect their family. And in a lot of cases, these uh, medical care companies, the nursing staffing companies and doctor staffing companies rented our apartments from us. But that took me rolling up my sleeves, getting on the phone and calling them manually. I'm a salesman. I know how to sell. I got on the phone. I'm like, oh, we'd like to get you some lodging. We're right near the, near uh, East Lake Woodlands and right down the road from these five hospitals and you know, we can give you a 30 day or 90 day rate if you book for 90 days. And we were able to book all of our apartments out and get back on track. But had I not had any sales or marketing experience and I was running paid advertising, you name it, we would have been in trouble. I know lots of uh, short term rental operators that really took it hard, real hard during COVID. And guys, if you haven't been paying attention, we're not out of the woods yet. Now, I don't know whether we're legitimately out of the going to be out of the woods or they're just going to, they, they found everybody's found. This is extremely profitable. The drug companies, the hell the, the article came out yesterday that 75 individual, I think congressmen and representatives in Washington invested in COVID related supply companies invested in the stocks that feed these things. I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. It's fact. Go look it up for yourself it's right on C-SPAN. It's not rocket science. So that tells me we've taught everybody this is extremely profitable. So don't kid yourself to think that this will never happen again. It'll absolutely happen again. Next time somebody needs extra money, watch this. They're going to come out with something different. That's probably just the way it is. I hate to laugh about it, but it's the only thing I can do. You can either laugh or cry, and y'all don't want to hear me cry on the radio, that's for sure, on the on the podcast. But, uh, yeah, you're going to need those skills, absolutely. Uh, next thing, thinking you can manage this all yourself. This is a lot of work, guys. Running a short-term rental is a lot of work. You're going to need to build a team. You're going to need some help. 
Uh, you don't get to have a bad day and be sick in bed when you're running a short-term rental because the questions and the comments and the needs and the, I can't get the door open and all that stuff is going to happen. And nobody cares if you've got a stuffy nose. Okay. You don't get to, to call into sick in sick to work when you have short-term rentals, unless you put a team together to help you. Fortunately, we've done that, but you know, I had to learn that hard lesson. And now we have the team in place that doesn't, you know, we don't have to be as hands-on anymore, which is a good thing. Okay. Um, this one is believe in the realtor. Next one is believe in the realtor when they say it's a great deal without making them prove it. I hear that down here in the keys all the time. People are like, Oh, this is a great va vacation rental opportunity. And my f first question is, is it licensed? And they say, well, no. Oh, well, are you aware that you cannot get a license on a property right now? That's not li already licensed in the city of Key West. And they go, well, maybe, maybe not. I'm like, it's not a maybe, maybe not. It's a definitely not. Uh, in that particular zone. It's not a receiver for zone. You can't do it. It's not licensed. It'll never work as a short-term rental. Meanwhile, the, the, the broker is going, oh, what a great deal. Nope, not a great deal. Terrible deal. Unless, of course, you're going to move into the house and live in it, then whatever floats your boat. But this is absolutely not a short-term rental opportunity. I've seen this back in the Tampa Bay market too. Oh, this would be a great short-term rental. Really? It's in a, in, a, in a cesspool. It's surrounded by a high crime community. Nobody's voluntarily going to go there and shell out $200 a month or $200 a night to stay in a slum and get shot at. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. It's just become like kind of a buzzword or a catchy thing to say. It's kind of like, honey, stop the car. Oh, look at those curtains in that view. Come on, people. Don't get suckered into this stuff. Wholesalers have now picked this up, right? Wholesalers and house and uh, flippers. Oh, this would be a great Airbnb. Really? Why would it? And then it's like crickets. You don't hear anything on the other end of the phone because they don't know. It's just what they say, right? It's like, oh, it's kind of like when you stub your, when you fart and you say, excuse me. That's really what basically the same thing. But maybe some of you don't say, excuse me. Who knows? Not asking for proof of past rental performance. If you're looking at a property that's currently operated as a short term rental and you don't ask for proof of its past performance, that's kind of dumb, don't you think? Well, Tyler, the past performance doesn't matter to me because I'm so much smarter than the other guy. Not really. No, you're not. You still want to know what the problems are so that you can fix them. You don't want to go repeat the problems that they're having so you can learn about them. Wouldn't it make more sense to learn about the problems that they're having before you buy it? That way you can fix them on day one, not day 365, because it's a lot cheaper to fix the problems on day one than it is on day 365 of ownership. That I assure you, okay? And depending on where your property is located, this is one that you might not have thought about. And I frankly didn't even think about this until I moved to Key West. But don't assume that the things that you need to furnish your property are readily available in the local community. Now, there are in Key West, that's absolutely the case. Now, you can go down to Fast Buck Freddy's and get furniture all you want in Key West. But, buddy, are you going to pay for it? An end table there is like two grand. So you want to furnish an apartment for a short-term rental? I'm sure they would love to have you. Great folks in there. I love walking in there on that place. The furniture is amazing. But unless you're planning on spending $40,000 to furnish a, a two-bedroom house, that's you might want to rethink that one, right? Just might want to take a road trip to Miami, maybe rent a U-Haul along the way. Those of you that live in the mountains or in, in far in far-reaching areas, maybe you're looking at a short-term rental in Sedona, Arizona. Well, Sedona is probably not the best place around to buy furniture, lots of places to shop, but it's not necessarily economical when it comes to furnishings. Maybe you're going to drive all the way to Phoenix uh, before you get furnishings for that property. Who knows? But build in that cost. And the same thing goes if you're going to have somebody put that stuff together for you, make sure the labor pool actually exists in your close proximity to your market. Sedona, Arizona, Key West, great examples. Sometimes out in the sticks in Georgia and the Carolinas, up in the mountains, Tennessee, Kentucky, these are places where you may not be able to get direct access or easy access to help to put these things together. So just keep that in mind. These are things I want you guys thinking about when you're out there analyzing these deals and putting this stuff together. And lastly, and this is enough. This is would technically, I guess, be number number eleven. But don't go out there with blinders on, run off half cock. Go get some training. Okay, I took lots of training before I jumped into this stuff. I learned from Cashflow Diary, Jay Massey. You go back to episode three hundred, listen to Jay. 
He's got a blueprint. You can text blueprint there if you go in the show notes and see the comments of where to get that information from him to take a take a listen to what he's got to say. Lots of good information out there, guys. Read books, watch YouTube, and most importantly, as I always say, get out there and take some action and make yourself some cash flow. Have a great week, and I'll catch up with you next week. This concludes today's episode. You don't have to wait till the next episode to learn to earn. Head over to CashflowGuys.com and contact Tyler and his team for more powerful tips and ideas. So you can start generating multiple streams of income and escape the rat race.